welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at the Rock. Let's pray. Would you stand um, and let's honor the Lord here in the house as we always do. Um, and let's pray together. Father God, I come before you right now and I ask that you would speak to us tonight, Lord. Humbly, I ask that you would visit us this very hour, Lord, as you are already here. Holy Spirit, teach us this moment, Lord. God, this is not about any kind of man or woman or tall or short, any color person teaching. It is about you, Holy Spirit. Father, thank you so much. See, the word is never the problem, but the ground. So, Lord, I ask that our hearts as the ground be good one tonight. May, the, may it land there, may it grow, give 100% full, Lord God, what we will receive tonight. Also, we pray for other churches in the Inland Empire and around the world. Lord, we do not consider ourselves better than them. No, we're not, Lord. Your word says that we're co laborers together with them, advancing one kingdom, and that's yours alone. Thank you so much for them. I pray that their churches be blessed and their churches will advance. You will strengthen the pastors today to preach your word, those who have service today and throughout the week. Thank you so much for them. In Jesus' name we say, amen. amen. You may be seated. Almost 12 years ago, um, I hope I got that right. Yeah, 12 years ago, uh, my wife and I got married. Uh, it's going to be a while, but, um, but I remember that first year we did something. We did this. I, I said, honey, how about if we celebrate our first year anniversary by going to a fancy restaurant and acting rich? That would be so cool. So we started planning right away. So every month we put 10 bucks aside, 20 bucks. We were just, there was this, uh, there's this hotel, there's a famous hotel in, in Vegas called the Palms and has a big restaurant at the very top. So you can see the entire city, really fancy French restaurants. Yeah, that's where we're going to go. We're going to try it. So we saved up after a year. Now, mind you, we're, you know, kids back then. We didn't make much money. And uh, we had saved about $250, $300, Okay. So we go to this restaurant. I mean, we're, we're playing the whole thing. We dressed up, and we had our gifts. We're exchanged for anniversary. We park, uh, pull into the um, carpool, you know, pull into the area where you leave your car. They park in, and it's just our car is a piece of junk in comparison to everything there. We don't care. We're acting rich, you know. We're just playing it up. So we give the guy the keys. We go upstairs to the very top floor. We tell the lady, hey, at the elevator, because you have to have reservations. Hey, hey this is who we are. Uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Oganda. Oh, yeah, sure. Come here. You know, they're walking us in. It was awesome. We sit on a, you know, very intimate little table by the window. You could see the entire valley, all the lights, all the stuff, and it was, it was pretty awesome. The night goes by, and so the guy comes in and says, hey, would you like water? Sure. I'm thinking, never been in a fancy restaurant, okay? Thinking just water. The guy shows up with a bottle of um, fancy, one of those things, puts it there. I was like, all right, so I'm serving my water, okay? But, you know, Tracy's looking at me like, uh, you have to pay for this kind of, this ain't tap water, buddy, okay? So I'm like, it's all right, you know, we're celebrating, you know? Uh, so we're, we're acting rich. Um, so the guy brings the menu. Menu has no prices. Usually, that's an issue if you've never been to one, okay? <laughs> so, so when the guy gives me, man, I'm thinking, all right, well, that's fine. You know, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, kind of where it's going to be, ballpark. And then he says, oh, let me recommend our favorite appetizer. And so the guy's recommending, oh, look, the table over. The table has four people, and they had two of those things. It was a seafood platter. It was absolutely beautiful. It smelled so great. I was like, man, it would be awesome, you know, for the two of us. And I happened to ask the question my first time, how much is it? Oh, that one is $99. I was like, we'll take the one at the bottom, and we'll go from there, okay? But it was very interesting to have a mentality and to be there. So it was a fun night. In the end, we ended up enjoying it. I don't remember. We spent all the money. We gave a good tip. It was, it, that was the plan. The plan was to have fun and act rich. Now, here's what's interesting. When we got home, I didn't feel rich. As a matter of fact, I almost feel sick that I spent $300 on a meal and I want to go to McDonald's afterwards. That's a problem. But many times when you look at the Word of God and when you see what the Word of God teaches, I want us to do something that I've been doing myself in my mind for my own family. I've been practicing like a rich person. Practice being rich. You say, Pastor, that makes no sense. I live in San Bernardino. Things are not easy. I, I, wanna, I want us to learn something from the Word of God. If you're patient with me and you walk this area with me today, I want to take you somewhere in your mind and in your heart that's going to take you out of your condition regardless of your income. I don't think you heard what I said. It's going to take you out of your condition regardless of your income. 
And it's so important for us tonight to understand that, that you have to practice in your mind and in your heart at being rich. At being rich. It's so important for you to do that because your king, your, your papa is a, is a gazillionaire. He owns everything, Psalm 24, 1 says, and everything that is in it is his. So there is a certain behavior that you and I need to have. I'm not talking about God's going to give you money. I can't make that prediction. If you ever do get money, then you have to have these principles in your life. I want you to know that. If you ever get money, you have to have these principles in your life. Why? Let me tell you why. You are wealthier than you think. As a matter of fact, Pastor Richard Clute is onto a website that tells you uh, the wealth in comparison in the world. Listen to this. In San Bernardino County, the average salary is $25,000. If you were to compare that to the rest of the world, you're in the top 8% of wealthy people. Top 8%. If you compare it to the rest of the world. Let's, better yet, the U.S. average salary is $49,000. That is the top 4% of the world. $49,000, if you compare it in hour wages, you're probably making about 15, maybe 20 bucks an hour, okay? So if you're making about 20 bucks an hour, maybe my math is a little off, but around there, maybe a little more. So, so if you're there, then you're 4% richer than the, I mean, you're, you're the top of the heap. You say, well, I don't feel like I'm on the top of the heap. I'll explain to you why. Listen to this. The stats about wealthy people say that no matter how much money you make, People always want, oh, you do that too, huh? <laughs> they always want more. Always. Always. They did a survey. They approached people, made $50,000 and said, how much would it take for you to feel rich? The average answer, $150,000. Okay? They went to the people in the $150,000 bracket. Do you feel rich? No, I don't. How much would it take for you to feel rich? $300,000, maybe $500,000, some people say. Okay. They went to the million-dollar bracket. Hey, you guys are top 1% of the world. You are wealthy. Well, we don't feel wealthy. We don't know if we're wealthy. What would it take to make you feel wealthy? If you have a million dollars in your pocket, well, maybe $5 million. Do the math. Every time they move up the ladder, everybody want it? more. So to be wealthy has nothing to do with what you have in your possession. See, it's not your possessions that determine the condition of your heart and of your mind and of your wealthy being. And God wants to drive that to us so that we don't behave and we don't do things and, and uh, behave and do things based on the world system. Are you with me? And it's so important for us to make that transformation in our own hearts and in our own life that we're not doing and we're not in that process. Why? Most people don't feel rich because feeling really richness in many ways is also a feeling. There's a certain thing. People, the more they have, they want to take care of more. They think they have to protect more. Listen to this. Most of the charity in the United States, the support for most of the charities in the United States came from the middle class and the bottom 20% percent of the population. The top percent, 20 percent of the U.S. only gave 1.3 percent of their income to charities. And the poorest people of this nation gave 3.4 percent of their income. So wealthy doesn't determine your goodness, doesn't determine your charity, doesn't determine what you give. There's a condition that's in you, and God wants to sign that. God wants to work on that. So no matter what you have, you're a giver. No matter what you have, you feel wealthy. No matter what you have, you know that there's something you can go to. There's something you can give. There's something you can do. Are you with me? Yeah. And so I want tonight to look at three things from the Word of God that will drive that point for us. And I, this started off for me from the story of Joseph. And I hear this, I've been, you know, my story, I've been a Christian almost all my life. And so I always hear this in Christian circles. If you've never been a church kind of guy, I understand. If you're in a church kind of guy, this is the phrase I hear a lot. I want to be a Joseph someday. But nobody ever says, nobody's ever referring to Joseph and Mary. Because nobody wants to be the guy whose girlfriend's got pregnant from another guy. And so you have to marry the girl. <laughs> nobody wants to do that. Okay. So every time somebody says, I want to be a Joseph, they're talking about Joseph and Genesis. Now, this Joseph is amazing. He's the favor, favor son. The favor son of Jacob, who then becomes Israel. And Israel 
I mean, he's a good guy. He's got 12 sons. Joseph just, uh, came from the wife he loved the most. And so, I mean, this guy's favor is a good kid. You know the story. makes him a, a coat and, and all that. And so the brothers are jealous because Joseph has a vision. Inside of him, Joseph said, there's greatness in me. And I bet you've said that sometime in your own life. I bet you said, there's greatness in me. But all around me just doesn't show it. Just doesn't show it. See, but Joseph had greatness. He, was, he had a rich dad. They had plenty farmland. They had all kinds of stuff. I mean, th- there's something in him that drove that type of mentality. Bottom line is his brothers get all mad and jealous. And this guy is a little punk. He's the youngest. Who do you think he's going to rule over us? No way. And so they just go on. They, this, they devise a plan. <laughs> hey, man, we're going to kill this guy. I'm done. One of the brothers says, hey, you guys are crazy. We're going to kill our own brother? Let's not do that. Let's turn him into a slave. <laughs> like, it's any better, but whatever, you know. Um, so he said, hey, just sell him to this guy. So they sell him into slavery. Joseph goes on in, into Egypt. You guys already know the story. Uh, so Joseph goes there as a slave. He ends up in the house of a guy, of a general of, of the army of Egypt. His name is Potiphar. And good guy, supposedly. I mean, the Bible doesn't describe him any bad. Just a general from Egypt. Gives him a job. And Joseph excels in the job. I mean, he does it really, really well. And so, but you guys know the story. Things start to happen. And so he moves on through different circumstances all the way up to being the second in command, per se. So this guy managed all the wealth in the largest nation in the known world at the time. Imagine that. Just by himself, Pharaoh cared for nothing. I got Joseph, you ask him. He managed all the wealth. I mean, put together all the money you think the U.S. has, probably Egypt had more when it came to gold and everything because they owe no money to nobody. Get my drift? (laughs) So Egypt owned it all. I mean, they had it all because they had margin. Margin is when you don't owe anything and when everything is yours. So they were really rich, and Joseph managed a lot of income. And there was a type of thinking in Joseph that I want us to learn today. I want us to grab that. Are you with me? What, wealthy, what a wealthy person says. That's the question I want to answer. What a wealthy person, especially a godly wealthy person. I should have asked that. should have added that. A godly wealthy person says this. Number one, I can do anything. I figured that would be the response. Because when you make $40,000, you think, there's no way I can even say that with a straight face. But I want you to say, can you play with me? And say it from the bottom of your heart. One, two, three. I can do anything. See, unless that mindset is in you, unless that transformation comes to you, no matter how much money you have, you will always be behind in everything you do. Because a wealthy person says inside of them, I can do anything. I can do anything. I have a friend. He's very wealthy. His parents are very wealthy. They own beachfront lands in the Dominican Republic. They have all kinds of stuff. And I remember we would go out. And this guy was spent on stuff, and I'm thinking, man, that is the silliest thing ever. Is this guy out of his mind? Do you know what I can do with that money? Am I the only one who's ever said that? Liars. (laughs) See, because we think we can do better than the next rich person. The reality is that it's all inside of us. The transformation has to happen inside of us. Let me tell you about Paul. Paul plants a church in the city of Philippi. If you want to go there, Philippians 4. Very famous verse, very famous passage of the scripture. But it describes a condition that Paul does that is absolutely brilliant. Paul is talking to a church. Let me just set you there. The church of Philippi is a church that Paul encountered and planted on his way to Macedonia when he had received a great vision. And so Paul lands there. He starts a church. It's one of the few churches he did not stay for a long time. Not only Paul will stay, plant the church, put a pastor in place, move on to the next place. This time he went in, prayed with people. People came, their hearts to the Lord, and he took off. So there's a description when you read the book of Philippians that Paul loved this church, and they loved Paul, and there was a, a very beautiful relation between them. But Paul lands to a point talking about the generosity of those in Philippi. Verse 10 says, but I rejoice. Philippians 4, starting in verse 10 says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished once again. It's kind of uncomfortable English, but let me tell you what he's saying. Paul is saying, I'm so grateful that you started sending me offerings. You got it? That's pretty much what he's saying. Though you surely did care, 
but you lacked the what? Oh, man, opportunity. Opportunity. Paul is saying, you guys are so giving, and all you were waiting for is for a chance to give. See, if you're truly wealthy, all you're waiting is for a chance to give because you can do anything. Oh, we got to build some faith in the place. It's okay. It's okay. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Verse 11. Now that I speak in regards to need, Paul says, I'm not talking about that I need anything. For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I hide out it learned for a reason. You know why? Some people just don't learn. They don't. I'm going to show you how. Next verse, verse 12. Paul says, I know to be abased, meaning I know what is to be in lack, and I know what is to abound. I know. I have. I've been there. I've had a lot, and I lost it all. Everywhere and in all things, I have what? All. Oh, get it. You have to get it. You have to learn. You know what some people do? They go into hard times. When they get out of the hard times, you've seen it. I've seen it. We look at them and say, man, they're doing the same thing again. Because they have not learned. They have not learned. And Paul's saying, in order for you to be able to do anything, whether you have much or whether you have little, you have got to learn in whatever condition you're in. See, because wealth is not just a state of pocket full, but it's a process of learning that you say to yourself, I can do anything. When, I'm, when, I'm, when, I'm, when things are tight and when we have a lot, we're going to do great things great thing because I can do anything. Paul says, listen, I've learned it all, both to be full and to be hungry. Paul said, hey, listen, I've eaten great meals and I had tortilla and beans also. Either way, I'm okay. <laughs> Whether very little, I, that's, I'm good. I, I'm covered. Why? Why? And I, both to be abound and to suffer need. Paul insists, Paul drives the point. He says it in three different ways, abased and abound, hungry and full, abound and in need. He's driving a point. He's saying, you got to learn this. 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 It doesn't matter where you are. Why? The most famous verse, you and I know, four, Philippians 4.13 says, I... <laughs> Mignon, you're the only one who's going to be rich in this place because you said it. <laughs> I can do. I can do all things through Christ to strengthen me. When Paul was talking about that, he wasn't referring to just kind of this and that and miracle. He was talking about finances. Yeah, yeah. Finances. He said, I don't care if I don't have anything or if I have a lot. I can do all things through Christ to strengthen me. All things. All things. All things. Paul says, there's no limit to this. See, money is not the limiting factor. Your status is not the limiting factor. I can do all things. Is a mindset of a wealthy person, of a godly worthy person. It says, hey, man, it doesn't matter if you put me in a little room or if we buy a big old house. We're going to do good no matter what. And that is the mentality Joseph had. See, I believe this. I believe that Joseph was rich on the end, inside before he managed to dine. He was rich on the inside before he managed any money for Joseph. I mean, any money for Pharaoh, sorry. Rich on the inside. It's so important that we know this. Why? Because I can do anything. You have to have that mind. You have to set it in your heart and say, I can do anything. We can do this. No matter what we set our mind to, we can do this. I remember my wife and I, a couple years ago, we were going through this process and getting rid of all of our debt and everything. And I remember she said, you know what? We're looking at our bills and everything. She said, let's do this. For one month, let's just try it. We're not going to eat out for 30 days. 30 days. Oh, yeah, we can do that. You know, first day goes by, second day. Man, by the third day, it was like so hard. But you know what? I'm so proud of her because she pushed me and pushed the family to try it. I mean, we tried it. Nobody died because we didn't get. Are you with me? It's like, if we don't do that, oh, my gosh, it's going to be horrible. No, I wasn't. We just packed our lunches and we took stuff for the kids. We just wanted to try it. We wanted to change our, our mentality and challenge yourself and say, can we do that? Yes, we can. We can do that. We can stop eating out for a month. So what? And it was awesome. We learned something that we could do that. So I'm challenging. What is the one thing you're saying? I can't do that. That you say to yourself with God, I can do all things. All 
things, all things, all things. I have to, you have to put that in you. Otherwise, you will always stay where you're at. You have to push past that. Are you with me? The second thing that a wealthy person, a godly wealthy person would say, number two is, I can give everything. Uh, no, they won't say that. Do you know that most rich people won't say that? Do you know that? I just told you in the beginning. But godly rich people say, everything belongs to God. I can give everything. I can give everything. I can give everything. See, when you have that mindset, then things are going to start coming to you. But I bet you are like me. I bet you sitting there are thinking, Pastor, if I give everything, what am I going to do? How am I going to live? There's that fear. That's why it's so hard for many of us to move past the point of just putting a dollar in the bucket and actually trusting God and tithing. Because the mentality is not in us that we can give everything. I can give everything. As a matter of fact, when my wife and I were young, we made a decision. It was a personal decision. God is not asking you to do that. I'm not trying to be a hero, okay? I'm just talking about what we're doing for our own life just to, so you know where we're at, okay? You don't have to do this. But when we, we just married, when we're dating, we said we, never, we don't want a lot of things. And the reason why, not because we don't like it, all right? I like stuff, okay? I'm not acting spiritual here. I like stuff. But I said, if God ever called us to the mission field, I want to be able to just pack and go. It was a personal decision. So I want to be able to have stuff that I can give away. So that's why I only go to thrift stores. Just kidding. <laughs> I was reading through all these documents and stuff, and it says that the richer the person is, or the richer the person has become, the less they give in percentage. The less they give in percentage. I don't remember the amount, but um, the owner and designer of Facebook, I don't remember his name, whatever his name is, the owner of Facebook and designer of Facebook um, did something so amazing. The guy's worth like $6 billion, and he gave some money to a university he used to go to so they can build a room in his name. Are you with me? And I think he gave, don't quote me on this, $200,000. But let's assume he gave $2 million. Let's assume that. Let's assume he gave $2 million. Number one, he gave it so his name is on a building. Number one thing, is a selfish motive. Number two, if you put $2 million stacked together, it's probably about 10 feet high in bills of 1,000. About 10 feet high, okay? If you put $6 billion, it's like four Empire State Building. This is what the guy did. I'm so good. I have a dollar here, but I'm going to give you a penny. So you can blast my picture in the paper. I can be in all the blogs. Look how generous I am. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so that's why you and I need to change as a representative of God and say, I want to give everything. I want to change my mindset and say, not only can I do everything, I can give everything. Everything that I have, God, it is absolutely yours. You ask, I'll give it. It's yours. I know you're nervous. I'm not asking you to do it right now, okay? <laughs> but by Sunday, you better have gotten rid of everything. <laughs> if you have the attitude, if it's already set in your heart, then something's going to motivate God. Because, see, the Lord, it doesn't say in John 3, for God so loved the world that he gave one arm. He gave how much? Oh, his son. He didn't say Jesus is going to give out his spleen, one kidney because he has two. No. His entire son. His entire son. He said, here you go. It's yours so that you can be redeemed. You be the judge. You be the judge. How can I say no to God over my paycheck, over my car, my house? How can I say no to God? Now, don't get nervous. You're not there. I'm not there. All I'm saying is, if you ever want to manage a lot, that's going to have to be inside of you. That's all I'm saying. I've got to get going here. 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19. The Apostle Paul is talking to a pastor, young pastor, church in Ephesus, great man. Apostle Paul discipled this kid from a young age, just grew him. He said, 
hey, Timothy, I'm going to teach you a lesson as he's writing. Because Paul knew that in his church, in Timothy's church in Ephesus, there was going to be rich people sitting in the audience. He knew that. So he writes to Timothy and he starts telling him how to talk to rich people in the church. And he says, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, I'm reading out of the NIV. I'm sorry if you have a different version. I'm reading out of the NIV. It's on the screen for you. It says, command those who are rich in this present world. So Paul is saying, people who are wealthy right now, they have money. You need to tell them this. Paul didn't say, convince them. Hey, Timothy, uh, send them an email. No, he said, Timothy, command them to do what? Command them to do what? Not to be arrogant. Arrogant. If you're wealthy, there's a tendency to be arrogant because inside of you, you think it's yours. Not to put their hope in what? In wealth. Don't hope in those things. Don't, don't place your heart in them, which is so uncertain. And we all know that in America, we've all lived it in the last five years or so, where everybody put their hope in money. All of us, including myself, put their hope in the economic system of this world, and we got a rude awakening. Rude awakening. Hope and wealth, which is so uncertain, but put your hope. So Paul is saying the issue here is where your heart is, where you're placing your focus, your hope in wealth or your hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our what? Enjoyment. Hey, listen, if God gives you money and you want to go to Disney, go for it because he wants you to enjoy it. What he doesn't want you to be is to be arrogant. Paul's saying, God gave it to you. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. It's okay. It's okay to have fun. It's okay to pretend you're rich and go to a fancy restaurant. <laughs> it's okay. But don't be arrogant about it. Don't be arrogant. Continue to say, verse um, 18, if you want to read right there, verse 18 says, once again, command them to do what? To do good, to do good. Be rich in good deeds. To be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to to share. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Why would Paul tell rich people you have to be willing to share? Because you don't automatically want to give it away. So Paul has to say, command them. Even though they're wealthy, even though they have the money, uh, it doesn't come out of that pocket easy, man. So you got to tell them they have to be willing to share. Because the money I have belongs to God. So you tell me what to do with it, and it's going to go that way, Lord. That's just how it's going to be because I can do anything and I can give everything. Verse 19, in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation in the coming age so that they may take a hold of life that is truly life. One version says of eternal life. So, guys, if you are wealthy in this room today, this is a promise to you. God is saying, really use your money so that you can build a big bank account in the heavenlies. And if you don't have wealth and someday you want to manage wealth, you got to start doing this now. Now. See, because Joseph first managed Potiphar's house, and that was a tough situation. But then Joseph goes to jail. That sounds worse than being in somebody's house, if you ask me. But the Bible says that he thrived in jail. Once again, Joseph was rich on the inside way before he was rich on the outside. And Pastor Jim actually taught us that in lesson one of uh, freedom for our future. How important that what you manage now is crucial or you're not going to get more. You're not going to get more. As a matter of fact, Jesus talking about this in the parable of rich men, um, talking about true riches. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Are you still with me? Yeah. Okay your neighbors fall asleep, just elbow him. Luke chapter 12, verse 16 says the following. Then he spoke the parable. Parable is a story that has a spiritual meaning. Story has a spiritual meaning. To them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. Now, I got to stop there because I have never read it that way till this time I understood it. Listen to this. It says, the ground of a rich man yielded plentiful. This guy was already rich and became filthy rich. Doesn't say a poor guy won the lottery. doesn't say that. A normal guy got some plentiful. No, a rich guy got more. 
Does that seem unfair? That every time we watch the TV, you know, you see these athletes crying over $200 million. Oh, pobrecito, you know, little baby. I mean, come on. But this is the case. A rich man yielded plentiful. I mean, a bunch, a bunch. Verse 17, and he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? Ooh, what a problem. Verse 18, so he said, he said, so he said, I will do this. Brilliant. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there will store and there, sorry, I will store all my crops and my goods. This is so interesting because it sounds a little bit like America. Have you seen, have you seen a show called Storage Wars? You know why they have that show? Because people have so much, they have to put it in storage. Now listen to this. I've traveled extensively. No other country has storage. Zero. U.S. We have storage. For stuff we supposedly want, but really never look at. It's crazy. I mean, I'm serious. If you own a storage facility, don't be mad at me. I'm just, I'm just stating the facts, okay? <laughs> so this guy says, hey, I'm going to build a storehouse. I'm going to fill it up with stuff that I have because I got more of the stuff I already had. <laughs> Verse 19, he says, and I will say to my soul. See, he's talking to himself. I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods later for many years. Take your ease, drink, and be merry. Attitude of a lot of us. The system is designing us for that. The system is telling us. You know what the system tells us? Work, work hard so that at 65 you can play golf. <laughs> I mean, you're laughing because it sounds silly, right? It does. And, and that's why it's so important the attitude that people have in Christianity. Not only you can give everything, but you continue through everything. I appreciate our pastor. I don't, I don't want to put them on the spot. They don't like that, but they're not saying, I'm giving up working or God because I, I turned 60 plus. I'm not doing that. And, and I'm not talking about physical work. I met a guy when I was on the mission field, an older American man. He was 80 years old, and he would do two mission trips every year in his 80s. And you know what he did? He gave all his children their, their inheritance and took a portion and would travel to Latin America and build churches, build water well, and put the money to work in his 80s. Different mentality. This guy said, I can give everything. I'm not going to take it to the whole. Listen to this. Whether you're poor or rich, when you die, you leave everything. Did you hear me? Poor or rich, everything stays. So let's put it to work. Now, here's God's answer. I love God's answer. But God said to him, fool. Actually, I wanted John to make it big. I put it like font number 20 because, I mean, God was like driving a point. God was saying, because he said, I'm going to build barns. I'm going to relax. And God said, hey, dude, you're a fool. I didn't say it. God said it. Jesus is saying what God's saying. He said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things, things, things? Be which you have provided. Who? Who are they going to be? So sad. So sad. Because this is the importance. Verse 21. You ready? So is he. This is what Jesus is driving. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So is he who doesn't, who, who insists, and I want to build my thing. I want to do my thing. I want to advance in life and forgets to be rich towards God who gives everything for our enjoyment. That's what he, Paul told Timothy, everything. Guys, if there's a challenge for us here right now, the next three years is how to become rich in God. Yeah. Create a mindset that the next three years literally is a boot camp for life. If I, if I could describe it that way. It is creating a mindset inside of us to say, from the, rest, from the rest of my days, this is how we live. I can do anything. I can give everything because everything belongs to God. And we're going to build it and we're going to do it. It is a mindset. Because the wisdom of God is what's important. See, that rich guy kept saying, 
for, I would say, I would say, but God told them, you're a fool. The wisdom is so important. This is what we're learning on Sundays. We're learning on Wednesday. We're learning on, on every area. Your children's are being taught. My children, my children are being taught on finances, what the Bible says. That, I love that. Your young kids are being taught right now. This principles. Because we need everybody to live a life like this. That will carry on. Ecclesiastes seven twelve says, wisdom is a shelter. Like money is a shelter. So both are shelter. Wisdom is a shelter. Money is a shelter. Here's the difference. But the advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves those who have it. Doesn't say money. Doesn't say money. Says wisdom, one version says, will save your life. This is wisdom. God's wisdom is saying, become rich towards me, child. Come. You know you're rich when you have lots of things that money can't buy. You know you're rich when you have lots of things money can't buy. Now you're rolling in dough. Now you're rich. Are you with me? You don't have to clap. It's okay. Two things. I can do anything. I can give everything. And last one for tonight. I can be anything. Would you say that out loud? One, two, three. I can be anything. It's so important to drive it into your heart. Now, here's the problem. You choose whether that anything is good or bad. Hear what I said. The decision is yours. That good, that thing can be good or bad. You decide within your heart how good is it going to be because it's so important. In order to be truly rich, you have to have something Joseph had. Joseph had a forgiving heart. In order to be truly rich, you're going to have to be a forgiving person. Let me tell you, if you've ever said this, you don't have to raise your hand or anything. If you ever said, if I ever have money, I'm going to do so and so. If I ever have money, I'm going to drive my old neighborhood in my Escalade with spinners. I'm going to show them. <laughs> if I ever have money, I'm going to buy that little store. I'm going to fire that guy. <laughs> you said it too? Good. <laughs> you have to have a forgiving heart. Joseph had a forgiving heart. Joseph had a forgiving heart, and that is the reason I believe that is the clue why God entrusted him with so much, because he was unwilling to use his power, his influence, his wealth to damage his family. He was unwilling to do that. So God said, because you're willing to forgive, I'm going to give you as much as you want, man. Have at it. Have at it. Joseph was not going to use his influence to damage anybody. Genesis 45 says this. I'll read it fast because I'm over the time. I, uh, forgive me for that. Joseph, uh, Genesis 45 says, but now, now Joseph is together with his brothers. His brothers came to Egypt because there was a big old famine. And so Joseph notices that that's his family looking for food. But he doesn't tell his brothers that I'm Joseph. They don't know. Nobody knows. So Joseph says, bring those guys. He plays them a trick. He brings the entire family, puts them in a room, starts feeding them. And Joseph said, man, I cannot hold it anymore. I have to tell him. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that when he told them, he went into a room and wept so loud that even Pharaoh's house heard it. Joseph has so much pain and hurt from what his brothers did. So much pain that he cried so loud. Pharaoh heard it. Says the Bible. But even the death of that pain did not provoke him to hurt his family. Even though he could. Verse 5 says this. But now, tell his brother, do not therefore be grieved or angry. Um, with yourself because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. Joseph keeps it in focus. Just says, the money I have, the influence I have, had, I want you to know something. It has nothing to do with you guys. It's nothing to do with you guys. It has everything to do with God. God brought me here. God gave me this. He continues to say, I'm going to jump on to verse 8. It says, so now it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout the land of Egypt. Joseph said, listen, it wasn't you who gave me the wealth, but God did it so that I can keep you safe, so that I can protect you and many others. 
Guys, if you're ever going to manage a lot, not only can you be anything, but in order to be something, you're going to have to forgive. I'm telling you right now, if you're going to use your wealth and influence to damage others, you're not going to get a penny from the Lord. Just hear it from me. You can write it down. Pastor Paul said it. Find me a few years later. You don't forgive, you got nothing. You can be rich economically. You can make millions of dollars. But inside of you, you will be miserable. Because it's a state of heart, it's a state of mind, it's a transformation of who we are. Matthew 6, 19. Sorry, I have a lot of verses, but I just wanted to go through this. Are you with me still, or you want to just beat me up? Okay, I'm almost done. I love this because Jesus tells us what not to do, what to do, and why we should do it. What not to do, what to do, and why we should do it. Matthew 6, 19 and 21 says, do not... Lay up treasures. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth. He said, do not. So he's telling you, don't do this. Where the moth and rust destroys, you know, and, and everything's gone. Everything's gone. But verse 20 says, do this instead. But lay up your treasures where? In heaven. In heaven where nothing's going to be gone. Where whatever you do is going to extend forever. Do it there. Verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying that the chief, the main competitor, the enemy of God in you is your possession. It's not all Satan. It's what you have. Because what you have tells you what you're going to do. What you have tells you what you're going to do. And unless you take a revision in your heart and say, oh, man, my heart belongs to God. And what I have is not going to tell me what I'm going to do. He's going to tell me what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow him, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm not going to give all my heart to the possessions. Three things we saw tonight. Three things I want you to remember. Three things I want you to have in your heart so you can change your wealthy mindset to a new mindset that you can become wealthy. Are you ready? I can do what? Anything. I can do all things. I can give everything. There's nothing I have. Everything belongs to God. And what else? Give me that last one. I can be anything. I can be anything. Tonight, guys, if there's something I want you to take with you home is change your mindset by applying these things from God, and you will be wealthy no matter how much you make. God spoke to you. Give him a hand. Amen. Amen. You've been so good. Just give me five more minutes of your time. We'll dismiss. We'll send you home. Um, but we want to make sure that your heart is all right with God. See, we, we laughed. It was fun. And, but we talked about one thing that was really important. See, it was a mindset. It had to be in you. And for a lot of people, people think this especially in our country. They always say, hey, all roads <laughs> lead to heaven. I I'm going to go to heaven no matter what. I, I am not a bad person. I, I, I don't break the law, pastor. I mean, I just, I'm somewhat of a socially good, decent person. Therefore, heaven is guaranteed for me. And that is so wrong. I don't know why people assume that. And I want you to check your heart. I want you to check your heart because if you've ever said that, you're going in the wrong direction. You're going in the wrong direction. How about this one? How about this one? Many people say, Pastor, I'm not only a decent person. I, I've memorized some scriptures. I mean, I, I've read them. I, I know, I, I believe the Bible. The Bible is a great book, a great book of inspiration. You know what, what the Bible says? That demons believe they're not going to heaven. Here's what's interesting. Satan knows scriptures because he told them to Jesus. He's certainly not going to heaven. So it's not a matter of what you think you know. It's a matter of what's in your heart. In your heart. It's a matter of what's in your heart. That's what God desires. He desires. He wants your heart. I'll tell you how. There's a man in the Bible, in John. And it's so interesting because in that book, he talks to this man. His name is Nicodemus. Brilliant man, good man. As a matter of fact, says he was a leader in his church, in the synagogue. He, he should have known the scriptures. He knew them. They had the Old Testament. I'm, I can guarantee you he memorized the scripture. Yet to this man, Jesus tells him, hey, Nicodemus, you're a great guy. But you know what? You're not going to heaven unless you're born again. 
maybe you tuned off. Oh, man, born again. Born again is weird. People just make fun of them in movies, and they're hokey. I had a guy in my high school. He was weird, and he was born again. I'm not talking about weirdness. I'm talking about the condition of your heart. I'm talking about the transformation of your soul. That's what we're talking about. Remember the rich man? The rich man says, soul, drink, eat. You're going to be great. And God says, you're a fool. Because we think. It's not what you think. It's what you know. And this is what I do know, that you need God tonight to be in your heart. You need Jesus to forgive you of your sins, of your wrongdoings, so that you can have access to heaven. That's the reality for all of us tonight. That's the reality that you have to face and a reality that many of us did at one point and said, I want that. I want whatever it takes for the transformation of my soul. And that's what Jesus is offering you today. That's what we're offering you here today, that you do that today. That if you're not certain that you're going to go to heaven, make sure tonight. How do I do that, Pastor? Very simple, very simple. Tonight, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to hit my Bible. When I do that, you raise your hand. One, two, three, you raise your hand. You're telling me, Pastor, I want to, I want to pray. I want to ask Jesus to come into my heart. But that's a little bit embarrassing. Raise my hand. That, that's kind of difficult to do. In a room like this, people are going to see me. Don't worry about it. Ignore that. You know why? A couple of things. Jesus says this. When I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. You know what Jesus is saying? Hey, I want you to be in this or not be it at all, but don't play with me. Don't play with me. See, God is asking you to make a decision today so that you can start on the road to heaven and in a relationship with God. But you're going to have to raise your hand. You're going to have to overcome that moment of embarrassment. And I guarantee you won't be embarrassed because we're going to shout and clap for you and cheer you on in your decision tonight. You may say, Pastor, but I'm still a bit uncomfortable. Hey, exchange that discomfort for an eternity in heaven. Don't let Satan fool you into thinking that you can't do this. You can, and you will be able to raise your hand and give your heart to the Lord because you know you need him. You know you need him tonight. So when I count to three, that's what you're going to do. Why am I going to raise your hand? Listen, 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 why, listen, why? Because Jesus says, not me, he says, that if you acknowledge me before men, I would acknowledge you before my father. But right there in the same verse in the book of Luke, he says, if you don't do that if you don't acknowledge me. I won't do it either. I won't do it either. You know why? You know why? Because he already did. He went in front of everybody and died practically naked before everybody because he loved you. So he's saying, be willing to just raise your hand, pray, and we're going to begin a new journey today. That's the decision you have to make. That's what we want you to do tonight. When I count to three, I'm going to hit my Bible. You raise your hands tonight, and when you raise your hand, we'll pray together and we'll ask Jesus to come into your heart. Are you ready? Who should raise your hand? If you're sitting there and you know God spoke to you, then just do it. Just say, this is my turn. I need to change for the better. If you're sitting there, who should raise your hand? If you did and you pray, Pastor, I prayed a while back. It's okay, but maybe what you pray, you did not live out your life. We want to help you with that, but you got to start tonight. If you're not sure, then make sure. That's the decision you have to make tonight. You raise your hand, we'll pray together, and you'll be on your journey with Jesus. Are you ready? One, two, and three. Is there anybody here? Thank you. Just one. So a hand, two, thank you. Anyone else? Wave it at me. Thank you. You can lower your hand. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. There's five. Anyone else? Other than those five, they're saying, that's me. This is my turn. Is there anyone else? I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. This is your moment with God. You're saying, Pastor, I'm ready. I had to do it. Many of us had to do it at some point. I remember being 13 years old. Everybody knew I was a Christian. My mother was in charge of the finances in the church. Yet I had to stand there and say, I need God. I didn't care what anybody thought of me. I didn't care if people thought I was a Christian. It's not what people think. It's what you know. And God is saying, if you don't know, you've got to make sure. This is your turn. Is there anyone else tonight that's saying, that's me, I'm ready to do this, other than the five I counted? Anyone else? If you know you're six, seven, this is your turn. Is there anyone else tonight? I've done my part. God did his. It's your turn now. We're about to end. I'm going to wait a couple more minutes. Is there anyone else tonight? I'm waiting because I believe God 
has, and I'll tell you how many, five more of you. Otherwise, I would have been done, moved on. But I want to give you a chance. I'm willing to look like a fool so that God doesn't say that to you for not making a decision. This is your moment. This is your turn. Thank you so much. Thank you. See your hand. A few more of you. This is your turn. Just raise your hand, and then we'll pray together. They knew it. You know it. We know it. Just do it. Is there anyone else here tonight? Thank you so much. Three more of you. You, you know. You know you need to do this. Don't delay it anymore. We're not trying to embarrass you. We're trying to give you an opportunity. This is your moment. Is there anyone else that says, Pastor, that's me. I need to do that tonight before I walk out of here. I'm going to wait a moment more. I know it's a little bit uncomfortable. I'm sorry I'm making you wait. Please be patient with me. I want to make sure these people give their hearts to the Lord. I want to be obedient to God. Is there anyone else? The three that you know sitting there, you have to do this. Just do it. This is your moment. 30 more seconds, and then it's your decision. Is there anyone else tonight? This is your moment with God. All right, here's what I'm going to do. Those seven of you that raised your hand, this is what I want you to do. I want you to, in a moment, grab everything you have with you and that you come down here. But I want to do something a little different. It's going to be uncomfortable for you. Bear with me. When those seven come up, when those seven come up, the three that didn't, you have to come down with them. You have to make your way down here because God is asking you to do something bold for him because he did something bold for you. So I want to challenge you tonight that you do that. So the seven, you grab your stuff, you meet me down here. Everyone else, let's stand and cheer them on as they come down. If you know you're eight, nine, ten, eleven, just make your way down here tonight. Jesus, this is your moment. Nobody's going to force you. You decide. You raise your hand. Make your way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is your time with God. You came from this side. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. In a minute, I'm going to introduce a friend. He's going to pray with you. But I, I just, give me 30 seconds of your time. I, I normally don't do this, but I really, really, really have to obey the Holy Spirit. I'm going to go home and be sadder about this moment than anything else I've done tonight. So if you bear with me, I'm just going to ask you. There's one more. Just make your way down here. I feel it in my own heart. I feel it in my own heart. This is so weird. I feel it in my own heart. And I normally don't get this sense. You have to make your way down here. If that's you, God is knocking and saying, man, if you give me a chance, if you give me a chance, it's going to be different. But it's your decision. It's your decision. It's your decision. So make your way down here the next 10, 15 seconds. You make your way, and we're going to pray together, and you're going to walk into new eternity with life. I can't force you. I can't force you. But you know who you are. And all you've done in your life is fight with God. And all God is saying, and I'm saying to you, hey, man, raise the white flag. Just raise and say, I'm, I'm done doing it my way. I don't want to be a fool. I want to do it the right way. That's what God is asking you to do. If that's you, just make your way down here. Don't have to be embarrassed. We just want to give you a chance. Anyone else? I've done my part. Hey, if you're up here, I want you to know something. This is the best decision you've ever made in your life. I did it a long time ago. have never, ever, ever regretted it. Never gone back. 
because God is so amazing. Here's what we're going to do. In this church, we want to do several things for you. We want to pray. See that pastor over there, Pastor Joel? He's going to do several things. He's going to pray with you. You're going to ask Jesus to come into your heart because you have to do that. You have to invite him in, and, and he's going to walk you through the process. Then he's going to do a couple more things. He's going to offer you an S. PT. This is a person that's going to pray with you, a person that's going to walk you through some basic steps so that you become strong in God, okay? So you become firm. That's what we want. And then he's going to connect you here once again to church. Why? We want you back here. Make a commitment in your heart. Say, this year, I'm going to make, I'm going to make sure I'm here. I'm going to grow in God. I guarantee you, you will change. So make that decision in your heart. Give God a year, and it's going to be amazing. So Make a turn, follow Pastor Joel. He's going to pray with you, and he's going to walk you through this process. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.